Amen. 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 And he is a mighty God. Amen. Amen. Romans chapter 12, very quickly. Romans chapter 12. I just want to read these first five verses. Romans chapter 12. We are sim simply today talk about change. The Bible says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable or spiritual service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your minds, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and we all, and all members rather, have not the same office. So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Is that in your Bibles? Amen. Our gracious and heavenly Father, once again, we come to you with thanksgiving on our hearts and praise on our lips for you being such a wonderful and such a mighty God. Father, we come thanking you for this worship time and the, all of the singing, the, the praying, the reading of your word. We thank you, Father, for this and pray that we have indeed been edified and encouraged thus far and that you have received the glory and honor. And as we continue this worship, Father, as we come to this part of the worship where we are to receive your word, we pray, Father, that you might be with each and every one of us that we might approach your words with hearts that are willing to receive it, minds that are willing to embrace it, and praying that you would be with your manservant as he would teach, that you not only give him the words to speak, but that he will allow your Holy Spirit to work in and through him to accomplish your will. For it is in the mighty name of Jesus we pray and we ask it all. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Again, we thank God for this blessed opportunity of worship, and as we have come now to the portion of this worship for the reading and for the teaching of the Word of God, we pray that we might say something that will be encouraging to all of us as we strive to um, do God's will and do everything we can to live in God's favor. We are thankful um, today for this um, beautiful day that the Lord has blessed us with and praying that uh, we will continue to be thanking God so far. Uh, he has blessed us with such a mild uh, winter, but things change, amen? And uh, we're, those of us who've been living in this region, we're not, we're not unaccustomed to this weather and this time of the year. It's good to have with us today, brother and sister Walker, all the way from the Tonto um, Church of Christ. It's that Phoenix, Arizona, amen? Sitting right in the back there, so good to see them, and they're, they're looking well. And uh, at the, um, towards the close of our service, we're gonna ask Brother Walker to come and have a few words of encouragement to say to the body. And uh, so we thank God so much for them and uh, for their presence. We thank God also for the presence of all of us um, as we continue to navigate in this um, very tough time of, um, that we are experiencing in our country. Uh, I wanna continue to encourage us to um, be mindful of our surroundings, be mindful of our health, and um, continue to be uh, prayerful for all of those families who continue to suffer from the impact of this pandemic, as well as those families and our communities that continue to work 
um, around and deal with the injustices, the social injustices, and the, um, um, the racial tension that is existing in this nation. As people of God, I believe that we should always be mindful of the current events and the social ills of our society because particularly as an African-American people, we are impacted and um, we have to um, gear up. We have to strengthen ourselves. We are living at a very strange time in our history where um, we are dealing with the kind of unrest and that we haven't seen in centuries, years. Um, the insurrection that was the attempted insurrection of the United States Capitol has had a profound impact on the nation. And we are still feeling the impact of it because they have not stopped they have now targeted every state in this nation. And um, uh, I, so I continue to encourage you to be careful. Be careful, be mindful of your surroundings. We are hearing, continually to hear the, um, the um, interpersonal, uh, personal attacks that people are making on black and brown people just because of your very existence. And so we have to be mindful of our Christianity and where we are. And um, I don't know about you, but I'm not one of those kind of people who look at some of these incidents and say, if it was me, I would do this or that. Because I'll be honest with y'all, preacher or no, I don't know what I would do if I was confronted by some white supremacist about my very presence. Um, and if all of us was honest about it, I think we'll say the same thing. You don't know what you'll do. You might have to reach out and touch somebody. I don't know. But um, <laughs> this, this is not an easy task. This is not an easy task. But also, this is not something that we're unfamiliar with. We, want, we are not the first people who have to deal with this level of uh, racism that is existing uh, and that um, continues to be perpetuated in our communities. So it requires us to have a particular attitude, a mindset, a mindset that will encourage one another as well as a mindset to maintain who we are as a people and be strong about it, recognizing our identity and recognizing that we should live our lives in such an unapologetic way. I'm finding myself in meetings and in uh, workshops and trainings where when I introduce myself, I introduce myself as an unapologetic black man. And, and uh, because that's important right now. Um, I was faced um, with some opposition this past Tuesday um, out in Wayne County where we are working on the governor's executive order on police reform and reinvention of policing and the community. And I found myself face to face with confronting the county supervisor because he ignored my appeal to attend a meeting and he ignored my encouragement to invite black and brown people to this meeting. And I had to tell him that not only am I an apologetic black man, but I wanted him to understand who I was. I had to tell him that I am the president of the Wayne Action for Racial Equality and I am the director of racial and social justice and family equity at the university's Children's Institute. That this is my life work. That for him to ne negate black and brown people from this process is not only racist, but he has put the county 
at risk. For if they don't produce a product, and this is everywhere in New York State, every town, village, and city in New York State, if they do not produce a product by April 1st, they will lose their funding for law enforcement. So I challenged him on that. But then I had to keep in mind that as long as I am a child of God, as long as I am a preacher of the gospel, I have to be mindful of the constant change that I have to be making in my life, that I can't be that old Earl Green. And I got to be honest with you all, that Tuesday night, that old Earl Green almost jumped out. Like I tell people, I wasn't always Mr. Green. I wasn't always Minister Green. And this is, the, this is the struggle of the Christian. I'm telling you us to be honest about where we are in this life. As members of the body of Christ, as Christians, we can, we can walk around and, and when, sometimes when we're amongst each other, we believe that we were born in the church. But how many of us have a past? How many of us are still trying to get over some things in our past? And all of us are still working on some things because none of us have arrived. So I'm constantly thinking about ways that I can improve, ways that I can change. This process of change that God called us to is an ongoing process that we cannot neglect. Every day of our lives, we ought to be always looking for change, looking for changing to be better than what we are. I have made it a habit in my prayers that I ask God every time, every day, to bless me to be a better person tomorrow than I was today. I want to be a different person because I believe that every day for the child of God is supposed to be a step up. As we move forward, we're supposed to be moving upward. So we constantly have to be thinking about what is it that I need to improve in my life? What is it that I need to change about me that can make not only my life better, but what about my family? What about my friends, my neighbors, those who I encounter on a daily basis? Can I live such a life where I can encourage people, impact their lives in a very positive way That indeed, when I leave this earth, it can be truly said about me, may the life I live speak for me. You've heard me say often that the apostles in the writings of the New Testament, that they write from a foundation, from the three and a half year ministry, of Jesus. Everything that Jesus taught in his three and a half year ministry, the apostles build on that foundation for what we have here today in the New Testament. Jesus focused on the mental framework of man. Though he was living under the law of Moses and everything was still physical, when Jesus came, he taught and prepared them for the transition from the physical of the old law to the spiritual of the new law. That's why when Jesus taught, he appealed to man's mind. He appealed to his mental framework. He wanted man to understand that there was a necessity of change of the attitude. This is why he would teach lessons in Luke chapter 6 about the changing of attitude and, 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 and what a person produces out of the mindset that they have. He would say the good that comes from a man comes from the good treasures of his heart. He would say the evil that comes from a man comes out of the evil that's in his heart. He was talking about the mental framework. 
For out of the abundance of the heart, he said, the mouth speaks. And then he even dares to tell us that every tree is identified according to the fruit that's on it. And if that wasn't enough, he would come along in John chapter 15 and show us the importance of producing and being fruitful and productive in our lives. But not only does he talk about the branches that were not bearing fruit and what he would do, but he even identified the branches that were bearing fruit. And even as productive as they were, he says the Father even takes those and prunes them for the purpose of bearing more. On Wednesday night, we talk about pursuing righteousness. And even for those of us who believe that we are strong in our faith and those of us who believe that we have been consistent in the work of the Lord, I dare tell you today that God will take you and allow you to go through some things for the purpose of making you better. And sometimes we have to change our attitudes about that because some of the things that God allows us to go through, he allows us to go through it to make us better people, not bitter people. The struggles and the conflicts that we have are not designed to put us down. They are not designed to make us bitter. They're not designed to make us angry. They're not designed to make us vengeful. They're designed to make us better so that we understand how God, not only that God is working with us, but we understand how God works with us. So Paul comes along in Romans chapter 12, and I just want to share just a few things with you. I won't keep you long. In Romans chapter 12, Paul challenges us with these instructions. As a matter of fact, he does not provide just a suggestion or su these instructions. He, he actually begs. He pleads. For Paul saw the importance of this change. But he understood that in order for man truly to change. There was a task that man had. And the task for man in his relationship with God is to offer himself, to offer herself in such a way that that it renders a complete surrender. Mind, body, and soul. He introduces to us a new approach. For he takes the, the practice of the old law in offering sacrifices to God and offering what God has, has provided them, and, 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 and their offering was a show of gratitude. Their offering was a show of their commitment. Their offering was a show of dedication. And this was a continued practice. But then Paul comes along and says, I want you to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. The sacrifices were generally dead. When a lamb was offered to God for remission of sin, it was killed. 
All the offerings of the old law were dead offerings. But Paul says, I want you to offer a living sacrifice. What are you talking about, Paul? I want you to be able to surrender all of who you are. To God. I want you to surrender all of what you believe. I want you to surrender all. The totality of man is body, soul, and mind. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. You remember in Galatians chapter 2 and verse number 20, Paul ident identifies himself and then he, he, this is how we should be identifying ourselves, that it is not I that live, but Christ who lives in me. That when I surrender myself, I take all of who Christ is, I take all of what he does, I take all of what God has given me through him, and I surrender completely. I want to offer myself to God as a living sacrifice. But then he also says, holy, acceptable. How many of us understand that if we offer anything to God, it must be something that he's willing to accept? So I stopped by to tell you this morning that God does not accept all sacrifices. You see, in order for a complete surrender to take place, there are some things we have to give up. Amen? Paul identifies this in Galatians, in Galatians chapter 3. Beginning at verse number five, he begins that verse by saying, mortify therefore these members of your flesh. And then again in Galatians chapter, chapter, is that chapter five and somewhere around about verse number 19, where he identifies the, the works of the flesh, the things we have to rid ourselves of. I'm going to shut this down and in Ephesians chapter um, 4. I need just hold that when I'm, until I'm ready for it. I need Ephesians chapter 4, beginning at verse number 17. We're going to read verse 17 through verse 24. There has to be a su complete surrender. We cannot allow ourselves to come to God and still hang on to some old practices, old behavior, old habits. I'm going to share a few things with you to help us along this way in this process of change. But the first thing that we have to understand as the people of God, in order for change to really take place, how many of you would agree with me if I said we have to want to change? You got to want to do it. And this is the reason why in Jesus' teaching. He's always said, whosoever will. He was never forcing people to follow him. He never did that. It has to be a willingness of all of us to give ourselves to Almighty God. So in this process of change, it forces us to look at ourselves. This brings us again to this word, humility. You remember in Ephesians chapter 4, where the Bible, Paul says, I beseech you therefore to, off, to, to um, 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 be worthy. The vocation? Wherewith ye are called? With all, now that's, that's the word, lowliness. With all lowliness. That's humility. That's humbleness. The word humble, remember, we shared this with you last couple of weeks. The word humble really speaks to one's ability 
to look and to recognize one's inadequacies. So as I recognize my inadequacies, it forces me to humble myself. That's a process of humility. Because the more I look at my weakness, the more I look at my inadequacies, the less chances I'm going to have in trying to elevate myself above you. So amen when you can. It's hard for a man not to elevate himself when that man does not recognize his own shortcomings. Humility is better understood and experienced when one recognizes that he's not all he think he is. This is why right here in our text, Paul even says that we have to learn not to think of ourselves above that which we ought. It requires humility. And as I look at my own faults, as I look at my own inadequacies, it helps me to begin to let some things go because I know if I hang on to some of these bad habits, if I hang on to some of this bad language, if I hang on to some of this bad behavior, there's no way I can offer God all that he requires me to offer him. But if that wasn't enough, you know, he, he calls this offering, this process of offering ourselves to God, he calls it, do you see that word reasonable in your Bibles? That is the word properly translated spiritual. You see, what Paul is dealing with here, there's a connectedness between God and his children. That's your spiritual service. Your spiritual service is fueled. Here we go again. Remember we talked about the Holy Spirit? You see, we have to understand all of this in light of the fact that when we were saved, God gave us his spirit as a gift. We cannot offer ourselves to God in the way he requires us absent of the spirit of God. The Spirit of God must be in us. The Spirit of God must have taken residence in us. In order for my service to God to be spiritual, only God's Spirit can render all we do as spiritual. The connectedness we have to God is because He gave us his spirit. And I already shared with you all, listen, listen, God is not going to allow his spirit. God's spirit is not going to be roommates with the devil. Paul said to the Corinthians that God's spirit is in us. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit guides, it teaches, it reminds us, it helps us in our understanding of the Word of God. It helps us in our understanding of the things of God. Paul even said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, even the deep things of God. But without the Spirit of God, we can't do it. But then Paul says, not only should our service be spiritual, but then he says this, what I want to caution you on is making sure that you are not conforming to the system of this world. Be ye not conformed to this world. the word cosmos, but it goes beyond that. And it speaks to the operation of this world. 
the regulations, how things are set up for us to live, and that, that Paul wants us to understand that we live according to a higher standard. Don't be conformed to the system of this world. But he says, be transformed. Go through a process of metamorphosis that has to be a dying of our old selves. He takes the picture of the caterpillar. You all already know this. And that process of change that allows the caterpillar to move from that stage of life to that stage where the caterpillar now becomes a beautiful butterfly. This is what God requires of us. That we allow ourselves to go through a process of change that makes us different. Where well, we sound better. We sound different. We look different. We behave differently. You would think that people within the body of Christ would understand that process. You know what disturbed me so much this week? That as the investigation unfold on this attack on our U.S. Capitol, and as the unfolding of all that was behind the, the, um, some of the Congress people voting against the Electoral College certification, you know what disturbed me the most? And I, I know you all heard me talk about the difference between congregations and why a lot of our white brethren are operating the way they do. And I think I mentioned to you before that even as we look at the civil rights movement and the, the issue of race within the body of Christ, that one of the most racist religious groups in America is the Church of Christ. And that's why today we still have white churches and black churches. I've read the history. I've researched it. I'm about to do some training on it. But you know what disturbed me the most about what happened? That we have six senators. Four in the House and three that we know of in the Senate who are members of the body of Christ. One out of the six is the only one that supported the election of Joe Biden. They're all Republicans. These brothers who serve in Congress are elders at the congregation where they worship. These are the ones who would uphold white supremacy. These are the ones who I wonder as I look at this scripture, what happened through this process of change? Sometimes I wonder, did they ever read James chapter 2? I find it very interesting that this happens even among us is that we embrace certain scriptures and reject others. I'm still trying to wrap my mind around how we can understand this scripture. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, but yet we know it. We can say amen to it. But yet we maintain this very same old bad attitude. Well, I found out why. There's two things I want to share. There's there more, but I just want to give you two. There is two things that's going to hinder this process. The first one is 
we have to avoid being circumstance controlled. That's the first hindrance to change. You have to avoid being circumstance controlled. You see, being circumstance controlled indicates that, that your language, your behavior is determined by what you're going through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and what you're going through will determine, you see, that language and behavior, that is born out of the mindset. If there's a bad attitude about the circumstances you're facing, the situation you find yourself in, it's going to be reflected in your language. And if it is reflected in your language, it's going to be displayed in your behavior. So we have to learn how to avoid being circumstance controlled. Keep in mind, Paul told the Ephesians, be ye not drunk with wine wherein is excess. That Ephesians chapter 4, somewhere around about verse number uh, 17 to 18. But be ye filled, here it is again, with the Spirit. If the Spirit is dwelling in us, oh Lord Jesus, are you all with me? So we cannot allow ourselves, our behavior, our language, how we interact with one another to be determined according to the situation we're facing or the circumstances you're dealing with. The second thing that we need to avoid, and that is the hindrance of change, is being a chronic contemplator. Avoid being a chronic contemplator. You know what a chronic contemplator is? That's the person who's always thinking about what they want to do and they never do it. Chronic contemplation gives birth to procrastination. Tomorrow never comes. So change can never be experienced. If you're always thinking about it, you all know the people I'm talking about, right? Is that person always telling what they're going to do? They got that disease I, I call the Amagunas. They're always going to do something. Man, I'm going back to school, and I, and I, yeah, I got everything in place. And then you see them two years, two years from now, and say, man, did you ever get that degree? No, no, but I'm a gunner. being circumstance controlled, and being a chronic contemplator. You're always thinking about what you're going to do. You're always thinking about what you're going to change, and it never happens. Somehow that disturbed me sometimes in the church. I've experienced that right in the church. You know, people always, okay, well, we're going to do it. Yeah, we're going to put that in place. Yeah, we're going to do this, and we're going to do that, and we're going to do this, and the church never does it. It stays the same. Ministries become stagnant. Members become bored. Well, yeah, I'm going I'm to get to it. I'm going to get to this. I'm going to get to that. I can't stand dealing with brothers always trying to get to something. When you want to get to it? Yeah, yeah, we're going to take care of that. And we're going to take care of this. When? But let me give you these two things to help us. The things that will help us move forward is there are two basic things. Based on what we understand and based on what we know, there are two basic things we have to put in place. Number one is we have to understand the constancy of time. Now, y'all missed that. You have to understand the constancy of time. Yeah, Paul deals with this in Ephesians chapter 4, and I know what verse is that? Paul says that we ought to walk circumspectly. 
Am I right about it? That means we have to walk paying attention, being aware. All right? And then what did he say? Ephesians chapter 4, look at somewhere around about verse um, 17. Walk not as Gentiles walk, but what? In the vanity of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that are in them. Now keep in mind, he's talking about this lack of change. Read. Because of the blindness of their heart. Read. Uh-huh. All right, read. We have not so learned Christ. Read. If so be that ye have heard him and been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. You're somewhere around about verse number 21. Am I right about it? All right, read. That you put off concerning the former conduct, that word conversation. That old man, which is corrupt according to what? Deceitful lust. This is what we're transitioning from. Are you with me? But we're going to put on what? And be renewed in the, by the spirit of your mind. I told you it's a mindset. It's a mental framework. Jump over to chapter 5. Somewhere around about verse, I'm um, doing it on the top of my head. Look at verse number um, 17. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Jump back up to verse 15. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools. Listen. This is not anything difficult. Did he? We don't need any deep theological uh, explanation behind this. What Paul is really talking about is living your life in, in, in this world, moving about with a sense of of purpose and attention, awareness, that we don't live our lives bumping into what happens next, that we're supposed to be aware, walk circumspectly. And then he says, not as food. That we don't live our lives based on what drops next. What we bump into. Again, not being circumstance controlled. Like the dog, when you're trying to get your dog's attention, those of you have pets, and then before you know it, dog, squirrel. every scroll that runs by. You see, God don't want us to live our lives like that. Every circumstance that come down, every situation that come down that does not distract you, you are focused, you are aware, you're walking circumspectly. And you're not allowing yourself to be distracted. Not as wise, not as fools, but as wise. Read. Making full use of your time. Why? For the days are evil. Church, let me tell you something. We have to pay attention to the constancy of time. 
Yeah, yeah. And, and we have to make sure that our time is not wasted. Use the time. Paul says the time that we have should be used fully. That term, redeeming the time, literally means make full use of your time. Pay attention to the time that God has given us. Why? Because time is constant. Let me prove it to you. We started service. Did we start right at 10, Brandon? Okay. So we started at 10. If we started service at 10, how many of us understand that all of us right now are, have we been here for two hours? About an hour and a half? We are all now an hour and a half older than we were when we started. Did y'all catch that? And there's nothing we can do about it. Time is constant. And we are required to make full use of it. The second thing is not only is time constant, change is consistent. So we have to focus on the constancy of time and the consistency of change. How many of us understand? You see, these two things work hand in hand. Because time is constant, change is going to happen with or without you. Oh, yeah, yeah, change is going to happen. If you do nothing but get old. And if you read in, uh, is that Ecclesiastes 12? It talks about time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You see, one day, you can, you're going to get old. One day, the almond tree is going to blossom. One day, the grinders will cease. One day, the limbs will tremble. One day, the lights will go dim. One day, the fire is going to go out. This is why he tells the young to remember the Lord. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. Why? Because time is constant and change is consistent. So we are required. You see, this is what Paul is showing us. Time, we, we should not live our lives just allowing life to just flee by us. We should be engaged in this process of change because you, we can sit down and do nothing we can just sit down and just say well I, this is what it is this is how it is or we can get involved we can engage in this process I can't get better if I don't decide I want to be better y'all remember the man who who was crippled and he laid at that pool of Bethesda. Was that the, the pool? And, 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 and when Jesus saw him, it was pretty interesting that the only question Jesus had for this man is, do you want to be healed? Remember I said earlier, the first thing about change, we have to understand, you got to want to change. Or are you satisfied with the status quo? Or will you make excuses? Well, every time the waters are stirred, people come and they walk over me, and I have no one to help me in the pool. What excuses do we have for not changing?
I don't know about you, but I believe we ought to be living our lives in such a way where we shouldn't have to regret anything. We should never have to say, I should have, when you could have. And especially when you know you ought to. Say amen when you can. Now, let me close by saying this. Sometimes it's difficult for change to take place because we're hindered by events, feelings, our emotions. It could be, for some people, trauma. Some people need help overcoming events in their lives. This is why the fellowship and the unity of the body of Christ is so important. This is why it's important that we know one another and we know how to support and encourage one another. Because sometimes you never know what may be holding a person back from doing what they need to do. Sometimes we have to check in with one another to see if you're all right. There's nothing wrong with asking a brother and sister, how's everything going? Are you okay today? Do you need anything? Can I help you with anything? So sometimes it could be the impact of some traumatic event. Sometimes it can be the impact of this whole pandemic because we haven't been able to be together, all of us, at the same time. So it's important to check in. And then other reasons could be because some events and some of this trauma could cause people to be angry. And anger can be a hindrance. Because I haven't gotten over whatever happened. And I don't know what to do with this anger. And we don't ask anybody. So we just hold it. We internalize it. And the more you internalize it, the more it begins to eat at you. This is why we have in the Word of God ways to release that stuff from our spirits. See, our emotions are very powerful. And can I, can I say this to us? It doesn't matter what your reasoning behind it is. You can actually be justified in your anger. You could be angry for the right reason. But if you harbor it, if you hold it, and that anger turns into resentment, then you're not hurting anybody but ourselves. That's all we're doing when we do that. We don't have to be resentful because when, you be, when that anger turns to resentment, that resentment produces a spirit of retaliation. And then we find ourselves at odds with God. It could be a number of things that can hinder change. And then the last thing is not only, you know, it's, 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 really, it's really a spirit that we have to be mindful of. And it boils down to this, that the devil is at work. You see, those emotions can cause us to think when we look at one another that we are the problem. But you remember when Peter said that we ought to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God? Remember that? And in that process, Peter says that we should be aware that our adversary, 
The devil, he's walking up and down this earth seeking whom he can destroy. And just when you and I think that our battle and our fight is with each other, the devil is just doing nothing but having his way. That's all that's going on. And so as the people of God who has been given the Spirit of God as a gift, our job is allowing the Spirit of God to move in us and to work through us so that we don't allow the devil to distract us from what God requires of us. Let me tell you what the Spirit of God will help us do. The Spirit of God, even in our emotions, if we allow the Spirit of God to rule in our hearts, the Spirit of God will help us stay focused on the Word of God so that we are able to do what it says. So what does the Word of God say about when you're in your stuff? in your emotions. What does the Word of God say about the anger? What does the Word of God say about resentment? What does the Word of God say about retaliation? What does the Word of God say about hurt? What does the Word of God say about pain? What does the Word of God say when you feel like you've been, you, you've been misused? What do we do with all of those feelings? Well, I contend and it doesn't matter to me whether you agree with this or not, because I know it's right. I contend that we consult the Word of God to answer all of those questions. Because and the reason I say that is because I've been around long enough and I've been preaching long enough to know what happens when we consult our own thinking and how we feel. I've learned how to resolve issues. It doesn't matter whether it's personal or collective. It doesn't matter what's going on. I've learned that the only way to resolve issues in the body of Christ is through the Word of God. Period. This is the last Sunday of January. Next month, we're about to go through a process. We're going to do some changes. All right? And we're going to enter into a series of lessons entitled The Jesus Curriculum. We're going to establish a foundation that's going to challenge us in our resolve, in our Christian walk. And let me say this, I understand, and I'm going to make this appeal one last time, I understand that we have members, some brothers, who still harbor bad and ill feelings. Toward me. I'm fully aware of it. You all already know that because I kept it no secret. And I'm going to make this one last appeal. I made it before. I'm just going to ask that we do what is required of us by Almighty God. That's all I ask. And that if you still harbor those feelings, or if you believe that Brother Green has done something to harm you, to offend you, I will do, I'll continue to tell you, I am open, I will welcome you, 
I will sit down with you. All right. And for some of you sisters who are still frowning at me, get yourself together. Get it together. Because what I will not do is allow you to continue to have that bad spirit and won't say anything. And then you can never say that I have not given this congregation an opportunity to come to me and to speak freely. But I said this today, this is the last time. Now, if you continue to come here on Sundays and y'all still looking at me like I did you wrong, and I told y'all before, I didn't cause the problem here. And I already told the brothers, I haven't heard anything from the brothers that was a deal breaker. I even challenged you all to go to one another. Now, whether you did that or not, that's between you and God. But we're going to move forward. We're going to move forward. And we're going to do what the Bible teaches. And the Bible teaches that if you have an alt between your brother, if you have an offense to your brother, you are required by the holy word of God to go to that brother and to that brother alone. As a matter of fact, in order for our worship to be accepted of God, we have to reconcile. Say amen when you can. I'm not going to deviate. And when you show me that I was wrong, I'll be the first to apologize and repent. But if you never come to me or say anything to me, what can I do? You all heard me say before, if you never give, and I'm talking about all of us, if we don't provide each other room and space to get anything right, then what are we doing it for? Y'all know what I'm talking, y'all know what I'm saying is right. Y'all know this is right. God requires it. It's not fair to think somebody did something wrong and not give them a chance to get it right. That's not right. You got to give people a chance to get it right. That's what our fellowship and our unity is all about. And change cannot take place when we are not complying with what the Holy Scriptures teach. Amen. So this week, the first week of February, for anybody who does not come to me or you do not go to another brother and sister and get whatever we need to get straight, I'm not dealing with this no more. I've been here for a month and a half. I'm done. We're, this church is moving forward. And for those of you who still want to harbor anger and resentment and still evil eye in me, you better make a decision. Because I'm one of those kind of preachers that I gave the congregation space. I gave you, some of you all some room. But pretty soon, I'm going to start demonstrating what I am supposed to do as a minister, as a preacher, and I'm going to come down some of your streets and you're going to get challenged in a public way if the attitudes don't change. Now, this is a biblical mandate that I must fulfill as a gospel preacher.
the scriptures teach us, and we're going to have lessons on church discipline. We're going to go through those lessons so that when I make a move, you're not going to say you didn't know or you wasn't taught. We're going to look at the word of God and we're going to show you in the scripture. I told y'all I'm going to stay in the scriptures. You do what you want to do, but I'm not going to deviate from the scriptures. We're going to teach these lessons and what you learn is going to be between you and God is what you do with it. But I'm going to fulfill my obligation as a man of God and follow through with the biblical mandates of God. And we're going to implement church discipline in this congregation. Now, if anybody want to challenge me from the scriptures on this, I welcome that. But we cannot continue to do and to put up with bad attitudes and then think God is pleased because he's not. The Bible is very clear. So get me out of your heads and read what the Bible actually says, because I'm going to follow it. Amen. Be ye not conformed to this world, but be transformed by changing your attitude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The changing of the attitude. And this is the reason why in preaching the gospel, preaching the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is all inclusive of the instruction of what God requires of the local congregation, what God requires of his church. And we must live within the parameters that God has set. When those things are violated, the Bible is not silent as to what we must do to correct it. So truth is important. The truth of God's holy word is what's going to stabilize us, what's going to sustain us, and what's going to help us move forward. If we try to move forward outside of the parameters of God's word, we're going to run into problems. So we can't do that. We got to stay within the boundaries of God's word. Now, it's going to be difficult. It's not going to be an easy way to go. But as long as we stay within the boundaries of God's word, God is going to be with us. He's going to guide us. He's going to secure us. We already know this. And this is why we have faith in him, because he's a God of promise. And this is why we trust him, because this, this, we can't keep this kind of stuff, the security and that God has for us. We can't keep that kind of stuff to ourselves. We have to share it with people. And even in the midst of difficulties, the gospel must still be preached. For we already have example in scripture that even when the church had difficulties, the church multiplied. Why? Because they stayed within the boundaries of God's word. And in spite of the conflict, they continued moving forward and the church kept multiplying. And these are the congregations we see in scripture that had the same issues, the same problems that we have today. Even in the midst of a struggle, the church still grew. 
Oh, yeah. You know why? Because the church is made up of human beings. Amen. Amen. And as long as we stay in this human form, we're going to have challenges. We're going to have difficulties. We're going to have conflict. It's not the conflict. It's how we resolve it if we desire to resolve it. Amen? And I contend that if we have faith in God, if we trust him like we say we do, if we are the body of Christ, we will do everything we can to make sure that the unity and the fellowship of the body of Christ here at Northside stays intact and we can move forward together as brothers and sisters in the Lord. Amen. We come by faith, repentance, confession, and baptism as we together stand. And let's sing a song of courage.